again. Welcome everyone to this virtual meetup at the Iowa Quilt Museum. My name is Megan Barrett. I'm the director here at the Iowa Quilt Museum. We're located in Winterset, if you're not familiar. And we are just um, 30 miles southwest of Des Moines in this lovely historic community. Winterset is the home of the um, Madison County Covered Bridges, also the birthplace of John Wayne, the uh, birthplace of Fonz and Porter's love of quilting, and um, home to the Iowa Quilt Museum, of course, and two wonderful quilt shops. We are joined by Tony Jacobson. You want to give a little wave, Tony? Good morning. Tony is the curator of this fantastic exhibit that we are um, featuring today, Man Made. And we'll hear from Tony in just a bit. We're also joined by Deb Geyer of the Quilters Hall of Fame and Jack Edson, who is a fantastic quilter and we will see his work a little bit later. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping things. We do have everybody on mute, I believe, and we have stopped your video, which means you can see us, but we can't see you. Um, that will just keep the environment a little bit less distracting. We do encourage you to use the chat window, um, which may be at the bottom of your screen, um, to share any questions or comments that you would like to as we're going. And I will share those out to the whole group. You can also use a feature called um, raise your hand, which you can find um, in the participants window or perhaps in the upper right hand corner of your own video screen. If you raise your hand, I can unmute you and let you share something with the group. Um, of course, this um, virtual meetup is being provided um, free of cost, but we welcome donations to our two museums. Us here at the Iowa Quilt Museum will be sharing everything with the Quilters Hall of Fame as our cooperating um, institution today. It's a tough time for cultural organizations right now because we are closed to the public, which means we have no revenue, of course. Um, so if you are a lover of quilting and want to help support us to make sure that we can be ready to open, reopen strong um, when the time comes, we would appreciate that. And in just a moment, I'll be putting a donation link in the chat menu. Um, so right now I'm gonna turn it over to Tony Jacobson who is the manager at PeaceWorks Quilt Shop just down the road from the Iowa Quilt Museum. He's a fantastic quilter and teacher himself. And right now he is the curator of this exhibit. He is gonna give us a little introduction to the man-made exhibit. Go ahead, Tony. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I, when I thought of this show, what I've seen in the past with the men's quilt show, the men, uh, men only quilt show, is that it's been more of a juried show, just showing um, the top quilts that have been submitted to any given show. Um, with this exhibit, what I've tried to do is give more of a context of men in quilting. Um, what we're gonna see today are part of the historical quilts that I chose for this exhibit that show that men have been quilting in one form or another for uh, probably since quilting began. Um, I know that with um, Arnold Savage, who we're gonna talk about today, he started when he was young because he had um, rheumatic fever and um, his family had a quilting history and they were giving him something to do while he was recovering from that. Um, my own story was that I had asthma as I was little and so my grandmother was trying to find things to keep me occupied. So that was a way a lot of um, men got into quilting was because of um, things like that. Um, the other thing I wanted to show with this exhibit is the breadth of men in quilting right now. And so um, last week we were talking to um, artists who they're designing patterns or teaching classes and that's how they're um, being involved with quilting. Um, today we're gonna talk to Jack Edson and, and Jack does um, more just art quilts. Um, he does lots of um, wonderful other quilts too, um, but what we're showing in this exhibit and um, what he's most known for is his portraits, which are just absolutely fantastic. Um, and, and, and he does it mainly for enjoyment. And so we've got some people that that's what they're doing. They're either doing it as art or enjoyment um, we also have some in the collection that are people who are doing them for a cause. Um, we've got a couple of quilts of valor. Um, one was a, um, a veteran who um, learned to quilt when he was in his 80s, and that's um, how he got into quilting. Another was a 18-year um, um, veteran 
who found that um, quilting helped his PTSD. And so um, there's lots of different ways that men are involved with quilting and that's what we're um, trying to show with this exhibit. So um, today we're gonna talk about the historic quilts, which is, shows that men have been quilting. Um, the quilts that are behind Megan um, today are both um, from 1930, or they were at least started in 1935. One was completed, one was um, started in 1935. So that shows you that it's been, a, it, they've been around a while. We do have one quilt in the exhibits that's from 1890 also. So mm -hmm. we'll let um, Megan go back to the other two now. Very good, thanks Tony. Um, so you, as Tony alluded to, you see behind me two quilts. These are Arnold Savage's quilts that are on loan to us from the Quilters Hall of Fame. Um, this is the one over my right shoulder that was started in 1935 and actually completed um, in that same time frame. This is the one that was really interesting. It was started in the 1930s and not finished until 2010, amazingly. Um, and again, both of these quilts are on loan to us from the Quilters Hall of Fame. The Iowa Quilt Museum is a little bit unique in our organization. We have no collection of our own. Our mission does not include preservation of quilts, although that is a very important mission. And we're grateful to organizations like the Quilters Hall of Fame that do preserve collections. Everything we display is on loan to us. And so we're so grateful to the Quilters Hall of Fame for collaborating with us, both on this exhibit and this um, virtual meetup. So I'm going to turn things over to Deb Geyer, the Executive Director of the Quilters Hall of Fame, to tell us more about your organization and these beautiful quilts behind me. Go ahead, Deb. Thank you, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and we are happy that we have the quilts available to us to loan out. Um, we, we have a small, we have, we have a small collection and most of our permanent connect collection though is dedicated to our honorees pieces. And those are not allowed to leave the building. I cannot take those out for anything. So it's nice that Arnold has donated these quilts to us so we can take them out and share them with the community too in many different ways. And um, I'll talk a little bit about Arnold. Arnold loves quilts and he loves preserve the preservation of the quilt history. He comes from a long line of dressmakers and quilt makers. As Tony mentioned earlier, he learned to quilt as a young boy while he recovered from rheumatic fever. He was in bed for months doing this. His grand aunt, Mary Alice, gave him fabric thread, scissors, and a needle. And she showed him how to make nine patches. He made nine patches and he made more nine patches and he made more nine patches. I've counted 10 quilts in Arnold's collection that are made from nine patches made during that time. That's a lot of nine patches. So the, the quilt over your right shoulder that you mentioned earlier he, he named that one recovery quilt number one. That is the first quilt that he ever finished. It has over 19,900 pieces in it. Um, he quilted it on his mother's treadle machine. Yes, this one here. He quilted it on his mother's treadle machine. The nine patches are four inch, four and a half inch finished blocks, I believe. He set them 16 blocks across and 20 blocks down. And the pattern is Jacob's Ladder using nine patch blocks. And um, he finished this quilt in 1935. And as I said, he quilted it on his mother's treadle machine. Can you imagine? <laughs> I mean, it's hard enough just sewing on a treadle machine, but to quilt the quilt like that is fantastic. So Arnold has continued making quilts throughout his la lifetime, and he's been very active in the quilt world. He became an award-winning quilter. He inherited all of the fabric that his mother, grandmother, great aunts, and great grandmother collected over the decades. He, um, 
eight women that were dressmakers and quilt makers. He got all of their stash. So you can imagine the kind of fabric that he has. In 2010, Barbara Brackman designed a fabric line inspired by his quilt collection or his fabric collection and it was called Arnold's Attic. Along with all those fabrics also came all of their UFOs, which he has incorporated into new quilts. So he used all, all of their, he took a lot of their UFOs and finished them into quilts also. And he still has lots of UFOs left over. So he makes traditional quilts as well as the art quilt. Along with quilting, Arnold had two other careers. He was a Midwestern and national champion figure skate, skater in the 1940s and 1950s. And for 40 years, he was a figure skating judge. He was also a professional musician playing cello in orchestras across the Midwest. The Seth Thomas Rose, we can go to that quilt now. This project was started in the 1930s and it was set aside. Arnold set it aside. He told me that he really doesn't enjoy applique and I'm thinking that was probably why it was set aside for so many years. It was finally, he finally completed it in 2010. So that's 80 years it took him to finish this quilt. Isn't it beautiful? I just love it. You can see in the quilting, the numbers around the square. I hope you can see that. So it took him 80 years to finish this. When you look at your own UFOs in your closet, just know that all hope is not lost. <laughs> Arnold has been an active member of the Quilters Hall of Fame for about 10 years now. He donated his entire collection of quilts and fabrics to the Quilters Hall of Fame. Yes, Roman numerals. <laughs> um, this education collection has been a great addition to our educational abilities because we're able to use the quilts and display them and take them out and um, share them with the community. So I think that's about it that I have on Arnold. Awesome. Thanks, Deb. Um, tell us a little bit more about um, the Quilters Hall of Fame, kind of your current status and um, what your plans are. Of course, that's a little bit hard these days because we don't know what the future will bring, but you are closed to the public just like we are now, is that correct? That's correct. We've been closed since March 18th and um, we are tentatively op planning to open the 2nd of June. Okay. That is as long as all the local restrictions don't stop us from opening. Mm -hmm. um, we, we usually have a, an event in July, which is one of our main fundraisers. But this is when we induct a new honoree. And we have canceled that for this year because we didn't think it was going to be wise for people to be traveling at that time. So our, um, as you may know, our honorees last year were Marianne Fonz and Liz Porter. And that was a lot of fun. Our next honoree will be inducted in um, next year, 2021 and that will be Marty Michelle. Um, but we are hoping to open again on June 2nd, and we'll be opening up with Jack Edson's quilts. What a fantastic segue to um, introducing Jack Edson. Jack is joining us from New York State. Is that correct, Jack? Uh, Hamburg, New York. Can you say that again? Hamburg, New York. Hamburg, New York. Uh, Hamburg, New York. Okay, somebody told me that last week and I had forgotten. So Jack is um, a quilter, among other things. I'll let him tell you more about that. But for just a second here, Jack, I'm gonna see if I can show the quilt <laughs> you have in our exhibit. 
um, which is not this beautiful Seth Thomas rose, but is instead this um, self-portrait. So while we can hear your um, audio, Jack, tell us a little bit about this quilt in particular. Um, I've done lots of portraits uh, for quite a few years. And um, I ran across a photograph of myself um, from about when I was about 35. I was looking for my birth certificate to apply for social security. And in a box of stuff, there's this um, photograph I took um, 35 years ago. And I thought, you know, this would make a great quilt image. So um, I um, made a fabric collage. I put the, I have the fabric collage out. Um, I don't know if you're picking up the image of me, but um, this is the uh, uh, smaller, you know, one inch, two inch, I guess, square um, collage, uh, which um, I used to kind of test it out. Uh, to see if it would, um, you know, kind of hold for a larger image. And then uh, since then, I've used that image uh, several times. Um, I um, made a set of self-portraits, which were at the Rocky Mountain Hall of Fame. Um, I think I'll send them to the um, um, show at the Quilters Hall of Fame, too. Um, okay, one based on this image. Uh, and then another one, I took the camera and took a picture of myself, um, you know, age 68 or whatever it was at that time, uh, you know, in the same pose and did a quilt of that. So, you know, it's a, um, a combination piece. So um, there's often a kind of poetic theme behind the pieces now. Um, and with that one, it was, um, you know, I used to be young, and now I'm not. And <laughs> similar for the audience, um, you may be young now, but, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> so anyway, that's, um, that's the background of that um, piece that um, you have at the Iowa Museum now. Um, it's a nine patch. I mean, I've done the image many times, but I always use a different quilt block or, um, you know, so it's got to be different. We never make, I keep thing twice. Um, what would be the point? You want to, um, you know, try something new. Sometimes I start with an idea for a piece, a little formula, and then two hours into the piece, I change the formula. You know, something um, seems to be calling me, like, do it different, do it different this time. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, uh, often how they you never know what they're going to turn into. Uh, they're very, um, you know, uh, in the moment, doing them, and, uh, you know, change them a little bit at the end, maybe. Now, you're not a quilter by profession, is that correct? Uh, right. I was a librarian for 46 years, public library all different libraries, um, you know, from 1973 till two years ago. And in the library, um, I had little art shows all the time. Uh, it might be somebody from the community, might be from my art collection, uh, and sometimes it was quilts. And I found um, these were um, very good for me to show. I mean, I got this immediate reaction from people. They didn't know I had made them. And they were really responding to the quilts on the walls. And um, that's how I met someone in the audience here today. Eric Myers came into the library one day from out of town and um, basically asked, what, what's the story behind these quilts? And we became friends that way. And um, right now, even though I don't work at the library, I continue this quilt art show by putting a quilt, hanging it on my porch. 
um, so people walking by can see them. Any day that's nice out, I'll hang a quilt out. I have one out today. You have one out today, which I think, did you post that on Facebook today? I did. It's the uh, figure, the um, Bernini uh, St. Sebastian. It's brand new. I thought I was going to be able to share that picture. I could walk the camera outside if you wanted. Can you all see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So if I get to... So the screen that I'm showing right now, everybody, is um, the Facebook group called the Edson Fabric Art Workshop Group. And so this is where Jack posts a lot of information um, about his quilting, um, his current projects. And he had posted a picture today that I'm having trouble finding, but he's um, I hear that I'm outside right now if you want right. to. Uh... So, yeah, I'm going to stop sharing and put his video back up then. And so he will show us what's hanging on his couch. So you've got uh, a hanging apparatus just there where you can change quilts every day. Um, that's right. I use the hooks from uh, Christmas lights. <laughs> and, um, it's very simple. <laughs> you take down the Christmas lights and you put a wooden rod up and um, it's great. Um, it's, um, you know, no law against it. And it really works nowadays with the idea of museums being closed. Um, you know, people are being more creative about uh, showing their work. Um, here's the back of it. This one isn't quilted yet. Oh, wow. So, um, uh, this one, uh, there's another one on the, whoops, uh, I put it on the, uh, the floor of the porch. It might or might not show. Uh, we can see part of it. It looks like there's a little too much sunlight at the top of it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's the problem. Um, um, these are the brand newest. Um, and um, that is the um, isolation is, um, I've really gotten a lot of work done um, being stuck here. Um, and I think I would, you know, kind of lose my mind if I didn't have this artwork to work on during this time period. Sure. So um, I think we have to make the best of whatever, you know, whatever cards are played our way. Um, this is one I'd like to show. Um, I collect art. I'm very interested in other artists. Um, and then I became friends with um, a pretty famous American artist, Ellen Carey. And um, this is a piece of her work. It's a photogram. Um, and the idea was to collaborate with Ellen. Um, and then I made this large quilt uh, based on that. Um, it's laying on the couch. So it's rippled, but um, it has a good deal of um, line to it. Uh, there's um, your fabric and I use some gold thread to quilt it. Uh, sometimes I do quilt these by hand. And um, also when I'm doing a piece, I usually get very involved in subject. Um, if it's an artist, I might be reading a book on the artist at that time. Um, with um, Ellen, um, I did a uh, fabricage portrait of her. Um, I took the photograph too. Um, when you do a portrait, it can't just be, you know, an image of a person, but it's got to be, you know, it has to have an emotion in it. Um, and it might be one that we can identify with one word, or perhaps it's one that uh, is more elusive. So um, that's uh, frequently what I'm looking for. To pick an image 
<clears throat> I might look at 1,000 pictures. Uh, I'm always on the hunt for, you know, the next image for the next piece. And um, there's got to be something that, you know, completely grabs me. And my feeling is it will be very engaging to work on for, you know, a few days in the case of the collage or maybe three weeks in the case of the uh, quilt. So there's got to be really something. And my feeling is that if, if I feel it, um, the audience will feel it too when they see it. So your the subject matter has more to do with um, not necessarily who is the picture of, but what is being shown in the picture, what's the composition or the emotion of the picture. Is that? Um, well, uh, the second part is true, but it's okay. very important who the person is. Okay. Um, there are people that they might be my alter egos, you know, Thomas Aikens, you know, I wish I was Aikens. Um, you know, I wish I knew him, she was alive. Um, people that, um, there's something about them that um, rings a bell inside me. Um, the, at that time, uh, director of the Buffalo um, Birchfield Penny Art Center, Scott Propiak put together a show of contemporary quilts, I'm sorry, contemporary portraitists. Uh, and um, I had eight pieces in that. And Scott mentioned, he asked me the question, do you realize almost everyone whose portrait you do looks like you? And I didn't realize it consciously until he mentioned that. And looking back, um, I do see it uh, in many of them, uh, you know, people that uh, I looked like when I was younger or something like that. Uh, so there's always that connection. Uh, it's not just a picture, you know, of somebody with an interesting face or a, um, you know, interesting emotion on their face, but it's all of that, but it's also, the person has to mean a great deal also. I mean, uh, I read an interview with Chuck Close years ago, and he said when he does a portrait, um, he usually does his family or friends because he's going to spend months painting that image. And, um, you know, he feels the connection with the person uh, during that time period. So that's true for me, too, to a certain extent. Sure. So you mentioned you've been doing a lot of work during this quarantine um, and you showed us a couple of your newer projects. You've got something on the floor of your studio right now. Is that correct? I have stuff all over the floors throughout the whole house. And <laughs> this is, um, <laughs> this was, um, uh, um, I've done many quilted portraits of him. Um, this one is using diamond um, shapes in many different patterns. And um, the challenge with this one was to get the image, but to also have the patterns of the quilt blocks be very important. Um, usually in my work, there's a um, kind of a tension between the image, the realistic image of the face or the body and the quilt block pattern. Um, in some, the image takes precedence and in others, the quilt block pattern precedence. I think about um, during art classes in school, um, usually the teacher would say, um, find one thing and do that one thing. Well, I mean, that's fine for young students, but when you're really doing artwork, um, you can discard all these rules and have, you know, take two things um, and work them out uh, and basically see what happens with them rather than approaching it, um, you know, with yourself coming up with 
um, demands. It's got to be this way or it's no good. Now, let it happen. You're the person making it. And the piece is um, pretty much a, a life of its own. It's going to emerge if you let it. Jack, I had one question. Um, speaking of the, the, the diamonds and stuff, which comes first when you're deciding on what block you're going to use? Do you get, find the photo or the image that you want to do, and then you decide what block you think is going to work best for that? Or do you have a block in mind, and then you go in search of the image that you think will work best for it? Um, usually, I have an image. I've got many, many, many um, Xerox copies of many great faces that I'd like to do someday. Um, but I'm also always on the hunt for a new one. And um, sometimes I'll sit down with one image in mind and switch it right then and there uh, and just change it at the last second. And usually there's a quilt block pattern that I wanted to use and for some reason he haven't used it because maybe it's too difficult or I don't know how to do it or you know there's Y seams in it or something like that. And then at that same exact moment, um, I'll just decide to just go for it and start cutting. Um, so frequently these things are not planned out at all. Um, there's that moment of, um, you know, chance and um, you tell me what to do uh, rather than me getting it all planned out. And sometimes make one block and switch it. Um, like do something that feels more correct for that image. Um, with the Aikens block, uh, this was about being quarantined and it was tumbling blocks uh, because the world was tumbling. Um, that really is the um, answer to that question. Um, and um, I knew it was going to be a humdinger getting, you know, a readable image uh, with some of these very geometric um, quilt block patterns. But I figured, you know, I'm just going to see what happens. Um, I did one three years ago with... Um, pineapple, pineapple block of a portrait of Bernini. The quilt on the porch is St. Sebastian painting by Bernini, but I did a portrait of Bernini um, using pineapple blocks. And um, <laughs> pineapple block is hard to do just with you know, a couple of colors, let alone with a face <laughs> on it. One interesting story, um, where may, uh, maybe some of these threads will connect. I um, had, uh, I'm still working, and Eric Myers, who's watching today, was um, is a distributor for um, quilt fabric. And I had the portrait of Bernini almost finished, except for the corners of each block to the pineapple box. And I didn't know what to do. And I've learned not to worry about, oh, what will I do next? Or what will I do if there's a problem? Something always happens. Um, Eric, who doesn't live around here, came, walked in the library with boxes of, um, I think they were Civil War fabric samples. And he asked if I wanted them. And I looked at them and I thought, these are the perfect solution for the corners of those pineapple pieces for the Bernini portrait. So I, you gotta, you know, leave your work open, let other people, you know, help you with it and, you know, just make the decision you have to make at that moment when it's time to make it, not when it is. Jack, one of the questions that was just submitted through our chat window um, is a little bit in the same vein that you're talking about. Um, and Mike Ellingson, who joined us um, last week, he's got a quilt in this exhibit as well, um, is wondering more about the fabrics that you tend to use in your portraits. Um, how do you acquire those? What's your, what's your yeah. process? 
Um, well, um, I'm always buying fabric and I get actually excited when I see a fabric I like compared to other ones that don't thrill me at all. So um, always buying things. Um, <laughs> everybody fasten your seatbelt because I'm going to shock you. Um, this is my, it's a dining room, but uh, this is the studio. And um, these are the flesh colors. Hold your camera still for us this for just a minute so it can catch up. There we go. This is flesh. Okay. Um, to me, flesh is not, you know, that flesh color that we used to get in the flesh crayon, you know, kind <laughs> of a, or, you know, tan color. Um, to me, flesh is, you know, many, many, many different colors. Um, I, people give me a lot of fabric. Um, it's amazing how many people will call me and say, you know, I'm not using four boxes of fabric if you want it. Um, I go through a lot of fabric, so that certainly helps a great deal. Um, I put them all in laundry baskets, one per color. Um, here's brown. Okay, so there are, what, maybe a hundred of them. Um, I like colors that have two colors in them um, and he have a modulation of tone. Um, this will be very handy. In my last few pieces, I've been fussy cutting a lot. I want it to look like it's all kind of random and casual, but as the years go by, I'm striving to give them more like perfect. Um, and in a printed area, a printed fabric, you might find one area that's a lot more right than another area of the same fabric. So I like fabric that's both warm and cool. There's warm areas, there's cool areas, and that's light and dark is maybe two different tones in it. And so, one of the things that I've noticed um, watching your process on the Facebook pages is the fact that what you've come up with at first and really playing with the values and the placement of colors isn't always where you stop, that um, you'll take a look at it and you'll go back in and touch up spots where you um, want to bring out more detail. And that's one of the things that that really brings them to life is, is taking that second look at it and not just because it's been pieced once, you're gonna stop. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, I'm always trying to increase the aesthetic value. Uh, that's what I'm really trying to do. I go to a lot of art museums um, and look at a lot of art. And I'm always looking for the objective that is high aesthetics. What really makes the masterpiece like that beautiful? Um, I don't believe, oh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder or, you know, um, you like it, so that's fine. Now I'm looking for the almost scientific part that really fits um, rather than a kind of vague sort of reaction. And I'm trying to add that. Sometimes it's the color combinations that almost make you cry. So uh, these things do happen. With fabric, and this can connect with the two questions ago, certain fabric is so beautiful. Um, I do draw and paint also, but fabric is so beautiful to start with. If we start with that material that we really want to engage with and use, and then in our blocks, if each block is kind of a mini masterpiece, chances are the piece is going to be very successful.
But as Tony mentioned, it's important to go back. I usually go back and change several blocks, um, maybe pick out certain pieces and replace them with something that really, you know, hits uh, perfectly. I was planning to do that with the Aikens portrait, and I did not. Um, I was moved on to another project, and I decided to let that one stay the way it is. Um, some things you can't, um, if you change them, they'll be different, but they won't be um, of a higher value. Uh, yeah, it's different, but it's, you know, if you measured it aesthetically, it might just be the same. Um, same level. So that one, that one's done. That one's got to get quilted. I have to talk to Eric's wife about that one. <laughs> it's in a, a hexagon shape. So it's not uh, the rectangular shape. Um, my earliest quilt was a um, hexagon. Um, back when I didn't know how to quilt, I just, um, it was all about art. You know, these pieces were going to be art made out of fabric. And I never really loved that um, uh, aspiration. So Jack, do you piece by hand or do you machine piece? Um, years ago, my old art teacher, Jack Brockett, came to visit here seven years ago. I hadn't seen him in 40 years. And I so wanted him to like my work. And I asked him if he liked it. He said, I love it. I said, well, give me some advice. He said, the only thing I can tell you is two words, more and faster. Make more <laughs> and make them faster. So I've been doing that. And I use the machine for any straight lines, but I do hand sewing also. Sometimes I can do it quicker if it's got to land exactly in a certain place. I'll just do it by hand uh, very quickly. Um, the quilting, I with the big you know, important ones, they have to be either quilted by you know, some really excellent long arm quilter, um, or um, I have to do them by hand. Um, I do rent a long arm machine occasionally and do some sort of meander pattern, but, you know, that's not for the really excellent ones. Also, my friend Brian Parton quilted one, um, which will probably be in the Iowa, um, I'm sorry, in the um, Quilters Hall of Fame show. It's a portrait of Bernie. I've done a couple of portraits of him. Um, so, um, you know, the machine can do it a lot quicker. Oh, one thing, um, I do, I quilt, I sew standing up. Um, so there's not all that wasted energy sitting down, moving the chair, you know, sewing for, you know, 10 inches and then getting up. You know, so um, I put the uh, um, sewing machine on um, two old um, record speakers, um, you know, jacked it up about six inches. So uh, they had a piece of plywood. Um, you know, I just do it um, standing up so that wasted energy. If you think about it, I'm cutting, sewing, ironing, trimming, all those steps, uh, and you have to, you know, move around for them. So if you add in, sit down, get up, you know, it's extremely tiring. Um, I'll quilt, I'll sew for hours, um, many evenings, you know, dinner time till midnight. So, um, but some of it, uh, I just do them by hand, you know, curves. Um, I can do a, you know, a soft curve on a machine very easily, but certain ones, um, you really need to um, use some different techniques and it has to be done by hand. Um, I do a lot of um, 
reverse applique too. It's sort of a hybrid and um, molas, the reverse applique falls from Sand Blade Island. Um, and uh, having those around, I think, encourages the reverse. Um, uh, kind of invent a fungal technique variation of doing it. And you almost keep going towards how you're doing it. Seems like we've lost you almost completely, Jack. Oh no. Oh, now I can hear you again. Your video has stopped though. Oh, all right. We're, we're back together. Um, another fabric question. Do you use mainly quilt weight cottons or do you mix types of fabric? Um, I um, strive for all cotton and I have to use a variety of different kinds of fabric in order to get the color. Um, I really don't stop for, you know, the niche, niche, um, you know, type of quilt that many people do. Um, I really don't know the brands or any of that. Uh, kind of go by the feel. And um, I've been discarding a lot of inferior fabric lately. Um, if it's not a really good fabric, I just won't use it. Um, so that's one way of weeding out um, what I'm doing. But um, yeah, that nice heavier weight cotton is perfect. But sometimes you have to use something else to get that color. Sure. So, I use clothing. Okay. So it's evident to me that you quilt for a very different reason than I quilt, and I'm just a brand new quilter. Um, and a lot of my quilting is, um, I kind of use it as stress relief because it's very different than anything else I do in my day. Um, but you're very much an artist, and somehow you stumbled into fabric as your medium. And you mentioned that you made your first quilt before you knew how to quilt. So why? Why fabric? We've mentioned that it's, it's beautiful on its own and we would all agree with that. But how did you stumble upon using fabric as your medium as opposed to drawing or painting? Well, I also collect things. And um, at the time I started, I was aspiring to collect antiques and collect American quilts. I saw two big art shows um, during the bicentennial. Um, one was a Smithsonian traveling quilt show in, I think it was in Elmira, New York. I drove down there to sit. And then a church here in Hamburg had a quilt show with, I guess, quilts from the parishioners laid out on the pews. And I went to see that. And I rem remember vividly red and white quilt with um, a Bible verse um, in it hanging on the uh, choir loft. And I think those things um, really stirred something in me. Um, and um, so with quilting, we can use these patterns that were developed a long time ago and have been used continuously ever since. Uh, and use them for our purposes now. So I think that is the, uh, the connection that I look for. You know, I don't think there's any turning back from that now. <laughs> I think um, whatever the origin was, you know, take it and run with it. Sure. So what does the future look like for you? Do you have... Um any lofty goals that you're, any quarantine goals? <laughs> I would like someone to write a book about my artwork, you know, a big coffee table book, and I'm not joking. And also somebody to sort of um, um, use my collection, both the quilts in my collection and the artwork 
to, you know, foster something beneficial in the world? Where are the answers? Those are wonderful. So if anybody is listening and has the aspirations of helping Jack see any of those things through, we'll push you in touch. There's a book waiting to be written. There you go. There you go. Um, so we're coming up on nearing an hour and we decided that that would be kind of our arbitrary ending point. Um, so just a few things before we conclude. If you feel that you are able to make a donation to the um, Iowa Quilt Museum and the Quilters Hall of Fame, the link just went into the chat window, iowaquiltmuseum.org backslash donate. Any donations that we receive as a result of this program will be split between us and the Quilters Hall of Fame to continue the vibrancy of our two organizations and make sure that we're here to serve you and continue to promote beautiful quilts and fantastic artists like Jack and Arnold um, long after this quarantine is over and we get back to what we will know will be the new normal. Um, so thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, Deb, it's been a while since we heard from you. Did you have anything else that you'd like to share before we wrap up? Um, I'll just say that I'm looking forward to seeing Jack's quilts when we hang them in June. And we are tentatively planning uh, a workshop with Jack on the 25th of July. So you can watch our website for details on that if you're interested in taking a workshop with Jack. Absolutely. And the Quilters Hall of Fame work um, website again is quiltershalloffame.net. And that just went into the chat window as well. Uh oh. Quilters Hall of Fame. Mm. There's an S. Quilters. The S is in the wrong place. <laughs> quiltershalloffame.net. So sorry, I can't type and talk at the same time. Uh, and you, um, can, you could um, Google Quilters Hall of Fame too. We'll come right yeah. up. Absolutely, absolutely. And you have a Facebook page as well. Um, yeah. you, have a, you have a guild that meets in your quilt, um, in your museum, is that correct? You have a guild associated? Yes, we don't meet in the museum, but they are, their mission is to support the museum through donations and through um, volunteer work. So. Wonderful. Very good. Yeah, and I know that um, last year when I was there during the um, induction of Marianne and Liz, you were working on um, raising money for um, redoing the um, depot as a place to have yeah. additional pieces in. How's that coming along? That's coming along pretty well. It's slow, but sure. Um, we're working on the windows right now, and so they're all custom windows so it's going to be pretty expensive but we're going to do them upright so that they look like the original windows look like in the train depot this train depot was built in 1895 has beautiful uh, brickwork and stonework and we're really looking forward to putting in an education center there we'll have classrooms and we're going to move our research library into that building also and I don't think that we've actually said that the Quilters Hall of Fame is located in Marion, Indiana. Um, and you're in the former home of Marie Webster, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Tell us just in a couple minutes, Deb, how did the Quilters Hall of Fame um, come into existence? That's a great story. Okay, um, Hazel Carter, back in um, 1979, she felt it was important to honor the uh, our quilting heritage, the uh, people that brought quilting to where it was today, where it is today. And so she started the Quilters Hall of Fame at that time in 1979 in Vienna, Virginia. And she and a, a committee inducted honorees through the years. And then in 1991, when Marie Webster was inducted, Marie's granddaughter asked Hazel if they'd like to have the um, Marie's house in Marion, Indiana for a location of the Quilters Hall of Fame. So at that point, we were able to expand into a museum and, and a true location for the Quilters Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Very good. And how long have you been at the Hall of Fame, Deb? I have been here um, going on nine years. Very good. 
Well, on behalf of the Iowa Quilt Museum and the Quilters Hall of Fame, thank you so much, Jack, for joining us. It was wonderful to hear um, about you and your process and your history. And um, we're so excited that you have a quilt in our exhibit, our man-made exhibit. Um, we look forward to seeing photos, at least, of your exhibit when it gets installed at the Quilters Hall of Fame. Hopefully many of our viewers who are with us today will be able to go to Marion sometime in June or July and see that exhibit hanging. Um, thank you to Tony Jacobson for curating this exhibit for us. Um, and thanks to all of you who tuned in for our virtual meetup. We are meeting um, every Wednesday with artists from our exhibit. Next Wednesday, I'm gonna go on the move here, Next Wednesday, um, we plan to be joined by Eric Wolfmeyer and Bill Kerr. Um, Eric Wolfmeyer has, um, is an Iowa City quilter, and he has two quilts in our um, current exhibit. This one over my right shoulder, and this one that's now over my left shoulder. Um, they are both extremely large art quilts, and so we're looking forward to that. And then if I turn just a little bit more, we have some modern quilts by Bill Kerr. This one's called Billiards and uh, I can't remember the name of this one right off the top of my head. So these two quilts by Bill Kerr. So this will be our program next Wednesday, May 20th. Um, time has yet to be determined for that, but watch our Facebook page for information about that or our website, which is iowaquiltmuseum.org. You can also join our mailing list if you go to our website and you can receive direct emails about all of our events. We have not yet set a reopening date. We're waiting for the Iowa governor to let us know what that will look like. Um, but we are anxiously anticipating the day that we can welcome you into our hall again so you can see these fantastic quilts. So I don't see anything else in the comments. It is 1028. So we will sign off to all of you. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you online again. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Tony. And everybody have a lovely Wednesday. Bye. 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 <laughs>